Hey, fellow traveler, welcome to the Third Eye Awakening podcast, a show where we talk all about spiritual and psychic awakening, magic, the shift from 3D to 5D, star seeds, ascension, multiple timelines, multiple dimensions, the universe, the multiverse, the Akashic records, all the good things. I am your host, Amy Blair, and I'm so glad to have you here with me today. Okay, let's do this. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Third Eye Awakening. I'm really excited to welcome Tamsin Young today to share with us some of her story of spiritual awakening, lucid dreaming, a near-death experience, and I'm positive there's going to be even more than that. I met Tamsin through Instagram. She reached out to me and was just like, we got to, we got to work together. Like what is, how? (laughs) And so we decided to plan this podcast interview. So I'm really, really excited to dive into it. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. This is such a great opportunity. I am so thankful and so full of bliss and love right now. Yeah. So my name's Tamsin Young. I live in Australia near Byron Bay and on the beach. I am a stay-at-home mum with two kids and I have been through it. (laughs) I've been through the awakening. I've been through, I've studied it. I've done my own personal experience within it. I've had a lot of moments, talks about, of feeling crazy. (laughs) I think that when we get moments of woke, (laughs) as some may say, when trying to think and put those thoughts into words with people, those people that that don't, don't understand or don't know or maybe even have some inkling of an idea still sometimes think that you're crazy. It's a really, really hard thing to step out of your body, your step out of your, of society's expectations, I think, or knowledge, you know, our educational system, everything within our world is, is there to tell us to, to be in order, Mm. you know, to conform, to, to do what we it's, it, it's hard to even sometimes comprehend, to yeah. put into words for anybody to hear. But I have had some very raw experiences. And I've this is my first ever podcast and this is probably the first ever time for me to sit and actually talk to somebody that really understands, that really, you know, kind of wants to hear everything. I think a lot of the time people want to hear snippets of ideas of what awakening means. But to have somebody that actually wants to sit here and hear it all with the knowledge and understanding that it it is all as real as I feel it, Mm. that alone is just so special. Yeah, I'm well, I'm so excited to, to be able to connect in this way, because it is like the the thing I've been the most interested in consistently through my whole adult life anyway, to be like to understand what people experience, because I think most of us, most of us have these experiences to some degree or another. And it just depends on how we sort of categorize it. Some of us shove it away. And some of us really, you know, kind of like open up to it. But I definitely agree with you that we're, we're conditioned um, from so many directions on so many levels, right from the start to, to step in line and to not think independently and to, to create an identity for ourselves that seems authentic and separate, but it's actually like falling in, falling in step with, you know, how we're supposed to be to maintain order. But the truth is that we're so complex and we're, we have such unique experiences. So I'm excited to explore yours. And I would love to hear like what, what your starting point is like when you first started to experience like anything you would categorize as spiritual awakening. 
it's so funny because when I was preparing for this, I was thinking, what was it? Like, what was the starting point? What was it in my mind that took that little switch? And I can't identify exactly, but I can say that when I'm in my teenage years, as I think most people do, we have, we have moments where we want to rebel. We have moments where we want to step out of order. We have moments where we do things like underage drinking or going out to explore rave parties or, you know, illicit stuff. That isn't good, but I think for me, I've always consciously known about this stuff, but it wasn't until I went through those stages in my life where I was like, wow, epiphany after epiphany after epiphany of the unknown. Mentally, like in my mind, I was like, wow, where is this epiphany? Where is this knowledge coming from? So I have, like, I knew it. And in my mind, I was like, how do I know all this stuff? Like, I've never learned this. So it's like things were coming to me. I was about 18, I think, when I started having these strange epiphanies and just knowledge coming into my mind. And I, I didn't know where it was coming from, but I just knew it. And then I did research into things that popped into my mind and I looked into it. And that's when I looked into lucid dreaming. I, I saw that there was this thing called lucid dreaming because I was working two part-time jobs, sometimes 20 hours a day, and I hardly slept. And I, was, I looked into lucid dreaming because it's a, it's a form of sleep. So when I did a lot of research into it and I started practicing it, I was able to control my dreaming. After a very long time, see, the biggest thing that I told myself was it's not, you're not going out of your way. Everyone sleeps. So I made myself believe if I had four hours, I had to sleep. But if I lucid dreamed, I consciously didn't sleep because I was wide awake, but my body in four hours felt as though I'd slept for like eight. That's cool. Yeah. And for the first couple of months, it was really, really hard because your body goes into sleep paralysis. Yeah, that's it. (laughs) (laughs) And you get all these really weird thoughts come into your mind because I think that for me, I was really scared. So fear kind of took over. But then after a while, because I made myself believe I wasn't, there was no, I wasn't going out of my way. I was going to do it anyway. That I started to, I felt my spirit. Every time I did it, I felt my soul leave my body and that's when they say lucid dreaming you get this really heavy weight on your chest Mm. and you can't move your body and I got I literally felt my soul leave my body every single time really and and I went into different dimensions (laughs) in a way of astro traveling but I never astro traveled or what we perceive as our world That's really interesting. So what kind of things did you see then? Where did you go? To the best of your understanding, of course. Yeah. (laughs) You know, it's quite funny, really, because to start off with, to explain it in a way for the audience to really connect is I just went into the stars. Hmm. I just went up there into... What we would see is our outer space, but in my mind, in my consciousness, I knew it was like a different dimension and it was another life that I, there were moments, there were different different lucid dreamings where I went into my past life, my future life or whatever it is I was having. And then for a couple of months there, I was kind of 
going in and out of all of those dimensions those those different realms yeah that I had to really try and sit back and focus on which one did I want to go into which one was it that I needed at the time and so you got to a point where you could sort of like distinguish between different like realms or places (laughs) yeah for lack of better terms, and you could sort of decide or, or like have an influence yeah. on where you went. That's so cool. Yeah. And, and I even went to what we would classify, which I don't anymore, but what we would classify as heaven. But I didn't die. Hmm. So for me, in my mind now, learning how to do that, heaven or the afterlife or where people go when they their soul leaves their body isn't death. Hmm. <laughs> it's 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 just it's just where all our spirits live. It's it's a place where we no longer need our human our human experience. Okay. So, okay. So that's so interesting. So there you, before you used to classify it as heaven, cause that was just sort of the, the framework you had for it. And now do you feel like there's a difference between the spirit realm and heaven? Like are, are they two different frequencies or realms or did it just your idea of heaven change? They're the same to me. They're the same, but it's just that when you, and, and it also came from another epiphany that I had when I did have my near, near-death experience, and I, I, I will uh, elaborate on that soon, but when I, had my, when I went into the realm of heaven, every single time I lose a dream, so every single night or whenever it is that at that point that I was able to have a sleep, what we perceive as heaven is like, What I perceive as heaven is a magic world of rainbows and butterflies and all the people that we have ever known to pass on, which it is like that, but it's nothing humanized. Right. So we have no, it is whatever we want it to be. So I believe that here now, our mind, our reality is our thoughts. We create everything and, and we could both look, be looking at something, the exact same thing and see two completely different things. But in heaven, we are able to have different dimensions or, or wherever it is that we go, different dimensions of our own thoughts seeing the same thing. Right. But, but multiple, like dimension, dimensionized, it's, it's insane to even explain. <laughs> yeah so so what yeah let me let me see if I clarify my understanding so in the spirit perspective if we're beholding the same thing like say you as a spirit and myself as a spirit we're beholding the same thing we we perceive it from different dimensions but also different dimensions within our own perception is that what you're saying like it's like it's like I think I understand. Yeah, I think I understand. And I think that actually is our experience as humans too. It's just that we're so enthralled by the the narrow, narrow amount of information that we perceive as 3D that we don't even understand that like there's like multiple 3Ds around us all the time. And it's just what we're focused on that seems to be the real thing. Oh, this is so cool. Oh, I love it. I love talking about it. And when I talk about it, I go to a place of out of body experience because mm-hmm. I can go back to what it is that I felt even awake. And that was my biggest biggest thing with lucid dreaming. I had to stop. I had to stop because I got to a point where I couldn't tell the difference between my reality awake and my reality asleep. That's really cool. And it reminds me of the movie. It's an independent film called Waking Dream. Have you ever heard of it? I haven't. It's a, it's like, I don't know. I think it was made in the early 2000s, maybe. 
and it's by Richard Linklater, who I think also did the like the 90s movie Dazed and Confused. But it's all kind of like it's like shot in real time, but there's these different segments and different animators overlay over top of the real time film. But it's a guy who is a lucid dreamer and he can't seem to wake up and he can't tell whether he's awake or not. And somebody tells him that like the way to know if you're dreaming is if you flip this, the light switch and the lights don't come on. But like at, by the end, it kind of suggests that like maybe he died and he's just in this like permanent lucid dream state. Anyway, it's really, it's really interesting. It's just a, it's not a sad movie or anything. It's just really interesting. What I did, what I had to teach myself to do to wake up and to realize that I was awake. And they say, when you lucid dream, you can't move your body. So every moment that I felt my spirit leave my, 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 my human form and I felt it go out and then when I got stuck into the what is real, what is not, I wiggled my toes. Okay. So if I could, if I could wiggle my toes, I could move. So then I woke up. That's so interesting. So in your lucid dreams, did you, well, I, but I have so many questions. So, so in your lucid dreams, did you have a body? Like if you were to look down at yourself, did it appear that you had your body? Yes and no. So I knew that my body was where I was coming from, but when my spirit left my body, it was just a, a figure. Yeah. It was just like, just a, a shadow yeah. of just there, there was no face, no, no arms, no le- just a figure. Yeah, I, I understand. What you mean. I think that's what sometimes I think that's what creation is like in the higher dimensions where we're not physical anymore. So like the sixth dimension and above where people have bodies, but they're more light bodies, they're light forms and yeah. all of our buildings and everything like that are just mental projections and they're mm-hmm. not actually solid. But in, in 3D, we actually are solid like that's the rate we vibrate at so that's so interesting because yeah. you couldn't wiggle your toes because you didn't really have toes per se <laughs> but if you're awake you could wiggle your toes because you have real toes <laughs> but then if I wanted to come back I knew that that's where I would come back to right so if I was in if I was in the lucid dreaming and I had nothing no 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 human toes or you know what we perceive as that if I was here and I wanted to wake up, I would just, I, I kind of, I was connected. So I could, I would just go wiggle your toes and then I'd wiggle my toes, not here, but when I did, I'd come back. Okay. That's so interesting. So, so, but you eventually stopped lucid dreaming because it was a little, a little much like was it sort of taking you out of the human experience like you were spending too much time in sort of like this non-physical realm and part of you was like yeah but you're here to be alive as a human yeah I think that I kind of I didn't go through that exactly I wasn't you know I wasn't kind of telling myself I needed to be a human because I loved I loved lucid dreaming I think it was more the fact that I was so scared every time I woke up and I went to work and I was driving I was having these like epiphanies again where I was like this human world this like we're so horrible like we we don't we're not nice to ourselves you know people aren't nice to us so I was having all these like crazy thoughts about the fact that where I'm from earth and our being isn't good and I was like, but I can't think like that because this is the experience that I'm going through now. And then I had to realize that it, all of those thoughts were coming from lucid dreaming and they weren't negative. They weren't bad. It was just that I needed to be able to tell the difference. Right. I now lucid dream again. I, I, I was able to get back into it, but be able to tell myself it's okay both ways. Gotcha. And what it is that's different up here is different here and that's okay because eventually I will end up here right that's so yeah. interesting so how long did it take you to learn how to lucid dream 
a couple of months, maybe like two months. So, you know, eight weeks of actually mastering it every single day. Mm -hmm. I had moments within that eight week frame where I was able to do it, but because my body had too much fear, it wasn't allowing me to actually get the beautiful side of it. So after the eight weeks was when I was like, I can't, cause I did a lot of research before and then whilst I was doing it and I was like, you know, the, to master it, you have to let that fear go. So you had to let your body go and you had to like, you'd be so vulnerable. Yeah. Or feel vulnerable anyway. That's yeah. Yeah. Maybe you are, I don't know, but it, it's the feeling I know because I can't get past that, but I also don't really practice. Like I just have accepted that and I'm doing other things. But whenever I start to like come out of my body for an astral projection, it, it'll it start and I'll start moving. And then my body like realizes what's happening. It's like, like my, my yeah. spirit comes sucking right back in. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, yeah. And I know it's just my body's afraid of being left behind. Yeah. 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 That, okay. That's so interesting. I love hearing that. I really like having a lot of themes in my conversations lately with people around the consistency required to cultivate a certain skill and the importance of like remembering that like diligence and practice is really essential and that there's like there's this whole period at the beginning of of any like whether it's lucid dreaming astral projection mediumship or developing psychic gifts or anything where it feels like no progress is being made And it can feel frustrating. And that's where most people give up and just assume they can't do it, which is not the truth. And that it's important to like keep going anyway. And then even when we start to feel that initial progress, that's like exciting. Like you said, we don't necessarily like we're not, we haven't mastered it. So like you might lucid dream all of a sudden, or you might astral project all of a sudden, but you haven't quite figured out how to do it consistently and feel like you are in control, so to speak, like, like, you know, that you're in the driver's seat of the situation. Yeah. Yeah. I feel the same. I think, I think that's, yeah. Like I said, I, I just knew that I wasn't going out of my way. And I needed the sleep and working so much, I thought if I have four hours spare, if I lose the dream and I let go and I let it happen, it will make me feel like I've had so much sleep. Where did you so, learn that? That's so interesting. I've never heard that before, but that's so interesting. You just knew? You just kind of knew? Well, when I was when I started practicing and doing it, I just, that's what I felt like when I woke up. I felt so, so refreshed. And I was like, and, but the thing is that when you, when you go to, into lucid dreaming, you're so active. Yeah. So it's not like you rested, but my mind, my body, my human rested because that's what I was functioning at when I woke up. Right. That's so interesting. That's so, so interesting. It makes me want to like start cultivating a lucid dream practice. (laughs) Teach you my ways. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) that'd be great. (laughs) So, so where does your near-death experience come in? When did that happen relative to lucid dreaming? That was very, so it's quite funny, really. All my moments of spiritual epiphanies and awakenings and different experiences happen at completely different times so my near-death experience was very it was crazy to me crazy there are some people that I try and like tell because it's such a huge part of me that just are like oh wow like I've heard that before but they never really take it in you know they don't go oh my goodness that is so real (laughs) so my story was I have this thing called costochondritis I have a weak rib cage and I can break ribs so easy Mm. now I had many experiences of hurting my ribs and breaking my ribs but at no point because it's a very unknown 
thing, the doctors really have no idea and you can't heal. They can't do anything about it except put you on heavy painkillers and tell you to rest. At one point I vomited and I didn't realise at the time but I broke four ribs. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I was in so much pain. I was laying in my bed for like a good eight hours just sobbing. Like I couldn't even cry yeah. because that yeah. was that hurt too much. Yeah. I could hardly breathe. I had, I was, I didn't know what was going on because at that point I was just still at home. It got to the point where I got rushed to hospital. They chucked me on enormous, enormous amounts of painkillers, morphine, and they knocked me out. I was laying in the hospital bed for I think it was three weeks, but every I was constantly on painkillers, so I was really not there. I have photos, and looking back at that, I literally look like I was just in a coma. Yeah. But I was I was awake and I was there and my my optimistic personality was still trying to tell myself uh, it was okay. Things were funny, you know. I was like, oh, you know, whatever, like this doesn't happen to everybody, like, oh, I've got to live with this. One night, well, one day, the doctor set came in and said to me, look, after all this testing, examinations you're not getting any better there is a risk of one of your ribs puncturing your lung and we can't do anything about it and it looks as though you have a week to live and at that point after three weeks of being in that hospital bed I had accepted it I I accepted okay I I'll go like if this is my story if this is how it's done okay so I just I continued to say yes to the painkillers because if I was going to pass I wanted it to be painless and and I and and in my mind I'd accepted the fact that I knew how it was going to happen and I thought I'm in hospital anyway. Everybody knows, everybody in my life knows that I'm here and that, you know, it's not an accident. It's not something that randomly happens. I'm like, it's okay now. So I accepted it. One night I was in the hospital bed and I died. I literally died. And I passed over. I felt that lucid dreaming feeling. I felt that lucid dreaming feeling, but I didn't try to lucid dream. I was, I left and I saw that I think in my mind, I saw what it is that we're told to see is that white arch with a gourd. I'm not religious, but I saw a white figure. So when I say I saw a white figure, when I lose a dream, I'm a black figure Mm. or or a dark shadow figure of some sort. But I saw the big white and it was big. Like in my mind, it was straight away, so far away. But then once I kept feeling like my, like my soul, my spirit was leaving, I kept coming closer. So I came and I spoke telepathically in no way does any of this realm have any faces, no normal anything? And he said to me, telepathically, you've passed. This is now your reality. And I, I was so confused because in my mind I was like, really? I just accepted the fact I was going to die and now I just did. Like it was that quick. And then on, in, my, in my peripherals, even though I had no eyes, in my peripherals I saw my stepfather who had passed many years ago. I saw my granny who had passed many years ago and they were, they were two figures standing like to the side here, white 
they were they were kind of more a white tinge a, like a, a grayish when he the or the gourd was really white like a glow and I was still like a gray shadow hmm. I saw them and then behind them was just all these other people that I have been close to that had passed my my stepfather said to me do you have a choice you've passed and you're with us now but is this what you want my granny said the same and I was and then all the voices like an like a orchestra was saying this is your choice you get to make the choice and I I was so dazed I was like but do I really like, is this like, if I've passed, then how is it that I get to make the choice? Like, isn't this just the story? Isn't this just what happens? And they, they said, but you haven't completed your purpose in life. Your purpose in life is something in your human life is something that you need to complete. And I was like, but I, I don't know my purpose. How am I meant to know that? And they told me. And then I just, it sunk. I sunk back into my body. I then went back to sleep and I woke up the next day and I jumped out of bed. I hadn't been able to walk in three weeks. I jumped out of bed and I ran out of the room and I said to the doctors, I'm going home now. And they all were like, get back into bed. Oh my goodness. And I said, I'm fine. I'm fine. Let me go. I need to go. And they were like, no, they put me through all the tests again. I, and I had no broken ribs. Wow. Nothing. wow. Yep. They told me that the only way I could leave the hospital is if I had 24 hours supervision, just in case anything happened. And they sent me home with enormous amount of painkillers. And they told me that I just need to go on bed rest. And I wasn't allowed to go back to work. I wasn't allowed to drive. I wasn't allowed to do anything for like at least six months but in my mind I was like whatever like you guys I'm I, I don't need to listen to you like I just passed <laughs> yeah that's amazing yeah you're like I just died and came back so like yeah. it's cool whatever you're saying yeah 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 I gotta go I got I got yeah. a purpose to fulfill so what was your what is your purpose do you know did it was quite funny really because in my mind I was like well I'm going to do that anyway. But it was, it was, see, when I say I was going to do that anyway, subconsciously I knew that that was my story and that was my life. But I don't think I had that realisation that I had to, like that was, you know, we do stuff in life and, we, and we're guided to our, pur- our purpose. We're guided to achieve these things. But we just don't really know that's that. Yeah. My purpose was I needed to become I needed to become the person in my family to not like I was saying earlier not rebel you know not be distant not be my own person because I I was just doing what I think life was telling me to do and so I I stood back I moved back home I was 21 when all of this happened. I was already living out of home for many, many years. And I went back home and I tried to do what I thought I had to by looking after my family and really becoming more in tune with their life and their personalities and their experiences and not feel disconnected. Mm. So was it a pattern in your family for people to like distance themselves from each other and connections, but distant connections? Yeah. So my, my, I lived with my mom and my sister and my mom has always been a very spiritual person. And for my teenage years, I always had an idea of what it was, but a sense of that's not who I am. And so then in my mind, I, I deliberately, turn that page over and was like no and so then I came back and I was like okay maybe it is and so I think that within those those times of her 
you know, trying to educate me and me rebelling, there was a bit of disconnect. But, you know, we all have a past and we all kind of sit back and go, is this something that we need to just focus on being our story? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's cool. So do you feel like then you've, like, do you, are you in the process of fulfilling your purpose? Did you, do you, do you feel like you've kind of achieved it and now you're just like, like free living, so to speak? Yep. So I, I had moments during uh, fulfilling the purpose. I had moments where I would get signs. I, when my stepfather passed, he came back as an owl Mm -hmm. And he used to send us signs where he would turn on electricity and do all those funny little spirit, I'm here signs. And I, when I wasn't fulfilling my purpose, I wouldn't see him. Mm. I wouldn't see that owl. And every time I made these decisions in my life where my head said, do this, and my heart said, do something else, and I made the wrong decision, I knew it. Like I knew straight away, this isn't, you're not on the path. And so when I made the right decision, I would just feel that. And I now believe, yes, I have completed my purpose, but it has taken me on the same road that I, fulfilling that purpose is the right path of what I'm meant to do, fulfill in my life. Yeah, that's amazing. So like, so basically there's that layer of purpose, but there was more to be fulfilled and it aligned you with the path of like, like they all work together basically. Yeah. 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 And, 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 you know, the funny part is that once I came to realize these things and I did what I, what felt exactly right, Mm -hmm. I, good things were happening. You know, like good karma was turning around. I was, I was happy. Mm-hmm. I was taking these, these, these steps where I no longer lived in like sadness or fear or worry. Everything was just moving in a good direction where my mind was always optimistic and positive and I had no reason to not be that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. I feel like it's not like, like knowing when we're on our path versus not on our path is so, to me, it's so obvious that like, it's so accessible to everybody, but it's just that what makes it hard. This is just my theory based on observation, but what we know when we're in alignment and when we're not, but what makes it hard is that often the aligned choice that keeps us on our highest path is confronting and scary and like requires us to like you know move through a fear that we have or some kind of limitation or like like for example facing the fear of disappointing our family's expectations or facing the fear of like leaving a job that isn't in alignment and being like oh my god what am I gonna do or a big one for me was facing the fear of having these conversations publicly because I just kept them bottled up really into like up until basically I think I started this podcast and now it makes me laugh so much but I thought I was gonna die like I thought I was gonna die the first time I posted on Instagram that I you know have had like spiritual awakening and psychic experiences I did it right before I went to bed and then I had this crazy dream that night and I woke up the next day and I was like like totally sure everyone was going to have unfriended me and be making fun of me, which is so funny because that's not even a little bit what happened at all, but our fears feel really real. And it's the fear of those fears that I think makes us tell ourselves that we don't know if we're on the path. Yeah. But I think everybody does. And I love what you said about like the signs, like first of all, external signs, like receiving visitations from your stepfather and also the the feeling of the way your life entered into like a flow state because we get constant feedback all the time and we kind of know what those signs mean. And I don't even think that they're, they're usually way less complicated. It's either like you're not on your path, get on your path or you're on your path. Good job. Keep going. (laughs) 
<laughs> and and I then started practicing, which I'd always known of, but didn't really know how to practice. But I started practicing the law of attraction mm. and the power of our mind and the power of our pineal gland and the power of our third eye. And the and because I'd had these experiences as a lead up. I and especially the lucid dreaming experience where I couldn't tell the difference between dreaming and reality I then started to practice how can I go into my third eye now and be able to create that reality of the law of attraction and I practice it and practice and I still every single day because that's what we are we our reality is our law of attraction what it is that we think and now I live in absolute abundance of my own law of attraction. Yeah, that's amazing. I love that. I agree with you totally. Like it is what we are. It's what we're doing by default all the time anyway. So like the, the shift, the whole manifestation law of attraction thing is to like harness it and become conscious of it. Like yeah. we uh, aware of our thoughts and aware of our emotions. And, you know, when we mix them all together, what do we then project into our external reality so that's really cool it sounds like like you had this real knack for like getting really passionate about something and then practicing it with diligence and and then starting to see the benefits I do I do I, I I find that when there are things that I really enjoy or I like that I want it to be then the passion inside of me, I feel that fire. Like I lit that spark is like, if I'm passionate, it's going to happen. Like, I just, I just know that it needs, like, that's what I need. That's the path. Yeah. And so what are you, so with all of these epiphanies that you've had, all of these incredible experiences that have given you an expanded perspective beyond just this, you know, narrow, narrow bit of information that we have in 3D. What do you think is going on on earth? Like, what do you think humanity is? What do you think, like, what is this life experience that we have? And what, oh, just to make it extra fun and edgy, what is, what do you think is going on right now in the the world and the collective humanity? I think, I think that we have taken a really, really big shift I I think that every I think that the the collective consciousness of the realm of earth every single person every single one of us every single plant every animal every our whole world has taken a shift and I think that we've continued to take that shift you know we we hear about things like the 2012 you know great awakening but it was happening long before that. I think that just recently within our Aquarius awakening, we now within this pandemic, as much as there is negativity, there's fear, as much as there is a sense of control or order, we're watching, I'm watching the first time where really connecting so much more than we were beforehand before when we could connect before when we were all together and we could go out there was way too much we had access to so much that we could our our minds wandered and we were rushing to work we were we were in such a race to not be fulfilled yes and now we're we're confined within the ones that we hopefully love living with we're now given the chance to sit back and say I can spend time with you I I have to stay home with you and I have to stay home with myself I have to start to love myself because when we're trapped at home in our own minds and we're fed fear by the media, the news, everything is fear, fear, fear. We need to make the conscious decision to step back and go, I don't need to hear it. Mm -hmm. It's going on. I can't control it. 
what is it really trying to tell us? We are now becoming so much more in tune with trusting ourselves. Mm -hmm. We're giving the earth a chance. We're stopping all the infrastructure. Oh, we, you know, we, we're having moments of stopping all the infrastructure, the airplanes, the coal steam gas, like things in our atmosphere that are just killing us. I believe that this is a huge shift in our world for all of our minds as a collective consciousness to sit down and say, I'm going to connect with you and I'm going to be there for you and I'm going to support you. And we need to look after our minds, our body and our soul. Because for those that may not have awoken, those that have an idea of how it all works, they're going to hear it and they're going to continue to get intrigued by what is it that's really going on in our world? What is it that's going on in our mind to make us think, should we listen to the angel or the devil? But if we continue listening to the devil to tell us that fear is what we should be drawn into then we're not going to be happy and happiness really only comes from our thoughts and we need to genuinely trust each other because before that we weren't we might think that we were but we were all just running this mad race to please somebody else which really entails we weren't being fulfilled mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that you said that we were all like racing to be not fulfilled. And that's totally exactly like we kind of allowed ourselves to be convinced that we had to constantly run on this hamster wheel, like going, going, going and not having the time to like cultivate deep self-awareness and explore our inner experience and as well as our relationships with other people, as well as our relationships with the earth and our desires and things like that. And then we as a result, we're like burning ourselves out and not, not achieving any sense of real fulfillment of our creative abilities and our potential and our soul purpose and our power and the highest expression of our relationships and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I agree. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. It's a super, super interesting time. I think that, I think this life experience, this human experience is like, and I know that other people have this belief too, but it, it's the feeling of being a soul, having basically unlimited potential, and then focusing yourself into a slower vibration that produces physical matter and taking on an identity of an avatar, like the, our human selves, that involves a a process of forgetting and involves more parameters. So we don't feel the wholeness of who we are while we're humans. But part of that is the thrill because when you have these new parameters, you experience different aspects of yourself within those confines. And also when you forget who you are, you also have the opportunity to then remember who you are over and over and over again. And it's such a thrill. It's like the ultimate, the ultimate prize. It really is. And I completely agree. And out of all of the chaos, I think that that is probably the best way that we can focus on what's happening now. Mm. And yeah. how, how do all of your experiences affect as a mother? Oh my goodness, as a mother. I think it's really hard. It's hard because we've been now given the chance to create this little human or these little humans who have their own spirit, who have their own purpose, who have their own thoughts and reality and try and teach them how to be. Simple things like Christmas, like Christmas. It was really hard for me to conform to that, but I did it because that's what we do. It's really hard. But I have been given the chance and the confidence from everyone around me that believe in me and know me to let my children explore who they are as humans and not just as babies. So I don't treat my children as babies. 
And I know that sounds very bizarre, but I treat them as humans. They learn from their own experiences with me guiding them. I let their imagination run wild. I let them make, I think a really big thing that we do as parents is we try and when we can see our children and we think in our mind, oh, my goodness, they're going to hurt themselves or that's not good for them, but they don't know that, we try and stop it. But I watch my children as if I'm not watching them. So if let's say my my children are with somebody else and or they're outside and I'm inside or whatever, I try and let them make decisions based off the fact that I can see them or, you know, who, if they're being looked after, that person is in responsibility of them. But I let them make the choices. So I don't, I don't influence them to live within fear or decisions. My daughter is only two and a half years old and my son is only nine months old. So they're still very young. Yeah. And I will continue to teach them the ways that I know that they can, comp- uh, that I think that they can comprehend. Mm-hmm. I will teach them about how much I know. I, I have a very distant relationship with society. I have a very distant relationship with the system, schooling. I believe that everything that we're taught isn't real. Mm -hmm. Like, of course, there are real things, but I believe that we should be taught a lot more than what we are. Yeah, or different things. Yeah. Yes. Of course, I'm going to send my children to school or whatever, however it is that that will occur. They will learn the system, but it's also going to be really hard and conflicting with me and my partner because he believes the same as me, that everything that we're taught is what whoever it is wants us to know. Yes. And so that's why I didn't like school. I was really disconnected in school. Sure, when I put my mind to it, even if I didn't know the information or the answers to exams, I knew it. Like in my mind, I was like, oh, yeah, I know that. But I didn't learn it. So I just hope that they have, knowing that me and my partner, both both my children's parents have that more in tune idea of where we're living now other than just what we're what information we're told to believe yeah yeah I think it's really hard it yeah it is challenging it definitely is challenging I agree with you that that's generally my kind of parenting approach too I have a son who's about to turn 16 and then I have a daughter who's two and a half and similarly I know what you mean it's like not treating them like babies like treat like caring for them like babies but not yeah. not assuming anything about their intelligence and their awareness because they're yeah. babies and I always I always feel like it's sort of like the acorn that contains the entire oak like they have the blueprint of everything that they are meant to be in their highest expression and that like my job is kind of to to guide you make sure you you know, stay alive, but not control you and let you unfold according to your own trajectory. And so far it seems to be working with the 16 year old. I mean, we have a really good relationship and he's, he's got a good solid head on his shoulders, I think, because he hasn't felt the need to rebel against any like enforced, you know, expectations on my part, but it is hard in the world because also he goes to school And I can tell that, you know, university or college isn't his part of his path. And then it really lends to like, then why is he having to like spend all this time at school? He's a great musician. He just wants to be creating. Why is he having to go and participate in this ritual? But at the same time, there's a part of me that's not sure if maybe there's like value to just also 
being part of the system and learning the system and like sort of being able to know what it's about. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I agree. I think that it's important because everybody has to learn that. I think it's important that even though so, so much more in me wants to stop my children from knowing that, I know that I know that. And I know that everybody that has gone through a spiritual awakening knows that, knows that side, which is probably a really, really big part and reason why we've all woken up. Woken yes. up. Yeah, you're right. Like it gives us the the contrast, the friction to propel us into awakening. That the, because we know the difference. We yeah. know what we shouldn't know. <laughs> yeah. And the more we know, we more we, the more we realize we don't know. Yeah. It's true. It's true. Oh my goodness. This has been such a great conversation. I feel like I could talk to you forever. I'll probably have to have you on again just to like keep having more conversations in this vein. Thanks. But Thank you so much for coming to share your experience of like lucid dreaming and the, the really cool perspective it's given you as well as your, your death experience. Like it's not even near death. Like you died, but then you were like, I'm not ready to die. (laughs) You came back. That's, that's amazing. And again, the, the expanded perspective that you got in exchange for that, that pain and that challenge that you were going through, I feel like it'll really, I don't know, just really enhance the, the state of mind of the listeners who resonate with it. So thank you. I really, really hope so. I really feel that I've come to a point in my life that I need, like, uh, and, and on my path, I need to share this stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that, like I was saying, in the, in whatever is going on in the world right now, I think that that's the, our biggest way of connecting, is opening up and and being able to share with others that if they've had experiences or they're having thoughts or or anything along these lines, they're not alone. Yeah, exactly. Not- totally, because like you said at the beginning you feel crazy sometimes, but mostly you feel crazy in relationship to other people's reactions or what they don't seem to be talking about. And then it it makes us feel really potentially really alienated and alone. And yeah. And like, we're just weirdos and everyone else is normal and like functioning fine. (laughs) And (laughs) I've come, sorry, I was just gonna say, but actually a lot of us are experiencing our own variations of these things. Mm -hmm. And I've come to realize that even though for many years I thought I was all of those things, I've now come to realize I'm actually special. Yeah. I've experienced these incredible things people talk about in stories. Mm -hmm. And like I was saying, people went, sometimes when I tell them these things, they're like, oh my God, I've heard about that happening before, but they still don't have that, that part in their mind where they go, wow, that's real. Yeah. So I now don't feel crazy. I now feel like I have expanded my everything to be able to now, as what some may know of as a light worker, to share and help everybody else because we all have a soul. We all have a spirit and we're all going to pass over to the exact same spot. And for those that want to hear and, you know, connect, this is where we are and this is, you know, this is reality. We're all going to go through some type of spiritual awakening and to have somebody just hear and say, you're not alone and this is, this is real. Yeah. Let's do that. Yeah, absolutely. It's what it's all about. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much. Oh, thank you, Tamsin. I'm watching the sun get stronger and stronger on you. And I'm looking out my window at like three feet of snow. <laughs> oh, I love it. I saw your video the other day about getting snow. Yeah. I'm here with the sun. 
<laughs> yeah. Well, I'll let you go so that you can get into some shade and back home to your babies. But thank you. Thank you so much for your time. And listeners, if you were listening and you enjoyed the episode, please take a screenshot of yourself listening and tag us in it. That would make us so happy. And also remember to share with anybody that you think would resonate and also rate and or review my podcast to help it grow okay everybody thank you so much thank you tamsin i hope you all thank have a great day or night wherever you are thank you so much for being here with me on this episode i appreciate you more than my words could ever say please remember to rate review subscribe and share and i will catch you on the next episode